Okay, our message tonight is titled, How to Postpone Your Funeral. If there's only one thing you could remember from this presentation tonight, it's, it's that, remember this, God loves you, and because God loves you, He wants you to be happy. Amen? All right, let's begin with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you so much, Lord, for your great love for us revealed to us, Lord, through Calvary's cross. Thank you for sending your son down to this earth so that we can have life and experience it more abundantly. Father, I pray that you bless us as we get into this uh, subject, Lord, about how to postpone your funeral. That is how to live happy and healthier lives in the here and now. Please bless us with a rich experience as we seek to know you, your will, and your plan for our lives better. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's go once again to Revelation chapter 14. We've been there several times before, but tonight we're going to look at this, these verses from a slightly different angle. Revelation chapter 14, where we have three angels with important end-time messages to the world. Revelation chapter 14, and we'll begin in verse 6. John says that then I saw another what? Angel. Now the word angel in Greek is angelos, and it simply means messenger. Simply means what? Messenger. These angels are not literal angels that are taking the message to the world. They're messengers. They represent God's people who are taking this important message to all the world. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. So the very first thing that's mentioned here is the everlasting gospel. And we've said the gospel is good news. This very important message begins with good news. Verse 7, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment will come. No, it has come. And worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and springs of water. This is the first of the three angels' messages. All right. Now let's go to the study guide. Under the subheading, Revelation 14, it says, The first angel of Revelation 14 calls us to fear God and to give glory to him. To fear God. What does that mean, to fear God? To fear God means to reverence God and to stand in awe of God. To fear God means to reverence God and to stand in awe of God. We stand in awe of God because He is awesome. He is holy. He is majestic. He is King of kings. He is Lord of lords. He is Alpha, Omega. He is the beginning and the end. And we realize that we are nothing but mere dust. So we come before God with this respect and this reverence for Him. And to give glory to God, what does that mean? It means to live your life for God. To live your life for God. We need to live for God and for His glory instead of for ourselves and for our own glory. As selfish human beings, it's so easy to be self-focused and to live our lives for our own glory seeking to make a name for ourselves. Making a name for who? For ourselves, instead of living for His glory and working for the building up of His kingdom. Fear God, says the angel, and give Him glory. The next question in the study guide, it says, does God want us to glorify Him in all aspects of our lives? What do you think the answer is? Yes. All right, I'm going to put some of these verses up on the screen. In 1 Corinthians 10.31, the Apostle Paul writes, Therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. What do we read in Revelation 14? The first angel says, Fear God and give glory to Him. Paul is saying, even in your eating, even in your drinking, Give glory to God. So according to this verse, there is a way that you can eat that brings glory to God. There is a way that you can drink that brings glory to God. Is that clear? Now, if if we can eat and drink in a way that brings glory to God, does it also mean there's a way that we can eat and drink that does not bring glory to God? 
Yes. Now, in 1 Corinthians 6, 19, the Apostle Paul says, Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you were bought at a price. Therefore, what? Glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Many people think that God is only interested in spiritual things. In what kind of things? spiritual things and only concerned about our spiritual health and the religious aspects of our lives. But here it says, glorify God in your what? In your body. Glorify God in your body. 1 Corinthians 3.16 says, do you not know that you are the temple of God and the Spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him, for the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. So again and again, we see the Apostle Paul saying that God is concerned about what happens to our our body. We need to eat and we need to drink and take care of these bodies so that God is what? God is glorified. That's right. Oftentimes, we think that God is not only concerned about the spiritual life or the religious aspects of our lives like praying, studying God's word, and we don't think that God is so concerned about these so-called small things. We go to the store, we go to the restaurant, and we buy whatever our our stomach craves, whatever our heart desires. Is that right? right? Or we go to a restaurant, and we order whatever looks good on the menu. And are we thinking, how can I glorify God. What Paul is saying is, when you eat, think about God's glory. When you drink, think about God's glory. For your body is the temple of the what? Of the Holy Spirit. He says, glorify God in your body. In 3 John verse 2, it says, Beloved, I pray you may prosper in what? In all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. Now, when he speaks of health here, it's obvious he's talking more than just about spiritual health because he says he wants us to be in health just as our soul prospers. So he's talking about more than just spiritual health here. John is assuming that the soul is healthy and he's assuming that your spiritual life is healthy. And then he says, I want you also to be physically healthy. Be what? Physically healthy. That's clearly implied by the context. To be physically healthy in in your body. Now, this agrees perfectly with what we saw in Paul's writings, that the body needs to be the place where we glorify God. So John here says you need to be healthy, not just mentally, not just spiritually, but physically as well. Now notice Luke chapter 2, verse 52. It says, And Jesus, who increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Isn't this interesting? It says that Jesus increased in four essential areas. Four essential areas. In wisdom, in stature, in favor with God and man. So Luke 2.52 demonstrates the four-dimensional Nature of man. You can jot these down. Intellectual, physical, spiritual, and social. Jesus increased in wisdom, that would be intellectual growth. Increased in stature, that would be physical growth. Increased in spiritual, that's in favor with God. And increased in social. Increased in favor with men, that would be social growth. So here we have the four-dimensional nature of man. Is God concerned about our growth in these four areas? Yes, he is. So let's do a quick review of what we have covered thus far. In Revelation chapter 14, the angel says, Fear God and give glory to him. This message goes out to all the world that we are to live our lives for God. And then in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, we saw that God wants to be glorified in our what? In our bodies. We can eat and drink in a way that glorifies God. 
We can also eat and drink in a way that does not glorify God. And then in Luke chapter 2, verse 52, we saw that Jesus increased in wisdom, in stature, and in favor with God and with men. We saw that man is an intellectual being, a physical being, a spiritual being, as well as a social being. If what we've covered thus far makes good sense, say amen. All right. Now, how does God communicate with us? How does God communicate with us? Let's go to the top of page two. God communicates with us through the, through the what? Brain. Through the brain or through the mind. The seat of the mind is the brain. Think of your brain as a spiritual what? Antenna. Spiritual antenna. Think of your brain as a spiritual antenna. If your brain is sharp, if your brain is healthy, then you can have a healthier spiritual experience. Does that make sense? Think of it this way. God forbid, but let's say that you were involved in a car accident, a terrible car accident, and your right hand got crushed, and they, they just couldn't repair it, and they had to get amputated. If you lose your, let's say you lose your right hand, could you still have a meaningful relationship with God even though you did not have your right hand? Yes, you can. Let's say that it was a very, very horrible accident. And let's say you lost all your limbs and you lost, you lost both arms and you lost both legs. Could you still have a meaningful relationship with God? Yes, yes you could still have a meaningful relationship with God. Because God communicates us through our, our minds. That's right. Yeah. God does not communicate with us through our fingers, our toes. It is through our minds that he communicates with us. And the seat of the mind is the brain. Let's continue reading. It says, The devil knows this, which is precisely why he would love to have God's people. What do you think goes in the blank? That's right, addicted to all kinds of substances. Addictions to alcohol, cigarettes, drugs, pornography, etc. compromises the integrity of the brain. Compromises the integrity of the brain. Next paragraph. God wants us to be in good health because a healthy body will result in a what? Healthy mind. Will result in a healthy mind. Yes. As we have seen already, God is very concerned about our body because as we've read, our body is not our own. God purchased it through the death of His Son on Calvary's cross. Your body does not belong to you. It belongs to who? It belongs to God. You might think, well, it's my body. I can do whatever I want. But, 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 but the Apostle Paul refutes that kind of thinking. The Apostle Paul said, you were bought with a price. You are not your own. The body is not your body. Imagine that I lent you my Ferrari. You're imagining because I don't have a Ferrari. <laughs> the reason we're, yeah. I let you borrow it and I said, you can use my Ferrari for the day, but there are certain stipulations. Certain what? Okay. I want you to put this kind of gas in it. I want you to change the oil every so many miles. I don't want you to go over 100 50 miles, and I want you to, etc., etc., and we go down the whole maintenance list. If you are the one borrowing it, would you say, I'll drive it however I want. I'll trash it however I want. I'll put water in the gas tank if I want. You wouldn't say that, right? If you're an intelligent human being, you wouldn't say that. It's my car, and I'm the owner of the car, so I have a right. I have a what? I have a right, a right to tell you how to take care of the car because it's my car. It's whose car? It's my car, that's right. <laughs> Friends, your body belongs to God. Can you say amen? We need to disabuse our minds of this idea, well, it's my body and I can live however I want. It's not your body, it's God's body. He purchased it and if that sounds good, say amen. 
God wants us to have a healthy body so that we can have a healthy mind. And in having a healthy mind, it will significantly increase our chances of having a healthy spiritual relationship with God. Healthy, bo- healthy body, healthy mind. It's kind of like happy wife, happy life. Okay? It, it's just, you know what I'm saying? Okay, some of you don't like that. Okay, how about happy spouse, happy house? Happy spouse, happy house. <laughs> All right, happy body. I mean, healthy body, healthy mind. Right? The converse is also true. A healthy mind results in a healthy body. All right? The converse is also true. What does it mean to glorify God? It means to live your life for God in every area of that fourfold dimensionality. Every area, whether physically, emotionally, spiritually, or socially. That's what it means to glorify God. Notice Romans chapter 12, verse 1. And I like the way the NIV renders this verse. The Apostle Paul says, Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as what? Living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of what? Worship. What are you seeing, saying here is that the way you take care of your body is a what? Spiritual act of worship. You can jot that down in your study guide. Is prayer a spiritual act of worship? Yes. How about singing? Certainly. That is a spiritual act of worship. Nobody would disagree that prayer, singing, and Bible study is a spiritual act of worship. But what about how we take care of our bodies? This verse tells us that how we take care of our body is a spiritual act of worship. Does this perfectly agree with what the Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians? Yes. Now, there are people who will say, oh, if it comes down to the end times and the mark of the beast crisis, the what crisis? The mark of the beast crisis, I will be willing to die for God. If it comes right down to it, I will die for God. Friends, I'm sure God is happy that you are willing to die for Him. But what God is looking for more in this day and age is not people who think they'll die for Him one day in the future, but people who are willing to live for Him today. Amen? In fact, if you're not living for Him today, I don't think when it comes down to it, you're going to be ready to die for Him. So let's answer this question. How can we postpone our funeral? How many of you here want to postpone your funeral? (laughs) All right. We can postpone our funeral by living according to God's plan for optimal intellectual, physical, social, and spiritual health. Optimum intellectual, physical, social, and spiritual health. What I want to show you now is practically how you can eat and drink to God's glory. And also how we can eat and drink that would not be to God's glory. Now you might be sitting there thinking, Martin, are you going to make a trip to my refrigerator? That's exactly where we're going. (laughs) So this is a quotation from the play Fellow Act 2, Scene 3. William Shakespeare said, O God, that men should put an enemy in their mouths to steal away their brains. What is this enemy that he's talking about? Alcohol. Alcohol. Now, as my wife shared on Sabbath morning, her story, by the time she was 20, she became a slave to alcohol. She went to sleep thinking about alcohol. She woke up in the morning thinking about alcohol. It was her best friend. The reason she loved it so much, it was because it numbed all the pain and sorrow in her heart. The only reason she was able to give it up is because she met Jesus and he had something far better to offer her life. Now, I have never, I've like tasted it, but I've never really drunk alcohol. I don't know what it's like to be drunk. But this is what I've been told about alcohol. Alcohol, the best nighttime speech slurring, 
headache creating, dehydration having, drink spilling, charm killing, so you can dance medicine. Does that sound like an, a good description of alcohol? Alcohol plus wash this equals what? Basic math. Alcohol plus wash this equals 911. And then alcohol said, put that on Facebook. It's hilarious. But alcohol was wrong. So very wrong. Now, there are people that say the Bible teaches you can drink wine. Yes, in fact, the Bible does teach you can drink wine. You can drink unfermented wine. There are two kinds of wine in the Bible. There's fermented and there's the unfermented stuff. Okay? The way I like to put it is rotten and fresh. Thank you. The unfermented is the fresh and the, the fermented is the rotten stuff. All right. In the study guide, under the subheading, Drinking Through the Glory of God, does the Bible teach that you can drink wine? Yes or no? Yes. yes. There are two kinds of wine in the Bible. The unfermented, which is the fresh, and the fermented, which would be the rotten. Now, someone's bound to say, wine is wine, all wine is fermented. In the King James Version, you don't have grape juice. It's not mentioned in the King James Version. There was one word used to refer to both the fermented and the unfermented. And yayin was the word used in the Old Testament. And oinos was used in the New Testament. And you could tell whether it was talking about the fermented or the unfermented by the context. By the what? By the context. So if they drank the yayin in the Old Testament and they got drunk, then it was clearly the fermented stuff. It was what? The fermented stuff. But if they were drinking the oinos in the New Testament and it was fresh from the vine, it was what? Fresh from the vine, it was the non-fermented stuff. So the word yayin is used primarily in the Old Testament. The word yayin is used primarily in the Old Testament, and the word oinos is used where? In the New Testament. These words can be rendered either as fermented or unfermented juice, depending on the what? On the context. That's right. Keep in mind that it is critical that we carefully and responsibly study the Bible in context. Notice this statistic. 40% of everyone who uses alcohol develops serious drinking problems. How many percent? 40%. Now, based on this, can you drink alcohol to the glory of God? What do you think the answer is based on this simple statistic? Imagine this. What if your dog bit two out of every five guests that came to your house? That would be 40% of the guests. If your dog bit two out of every five people, would you let that dog run loose in your front yard? Now, you're probably thinking to yourself, well, that depends. Do I get to pick the guests? Okay. That's not the point we're making here. The point we're making is this. If your dog bit two out of every five guests that came to your house, you would call that dog dangerous. Let's take it a step further. Okay. What if your dog killed two out of every five people that came to your house? Serious problems with alcohol can lead to a liver disease, drunk driving, an abusive out-of-control spouse, or a child that is born with fetal alcohol syndrome. Is God going to endorse something that brings about these kinds of horrific and terrible tragedies with such frequency? Good common sense says no. Anyone here, you have a loved one hurt or killed because of a drunk driver? Just good common sense tells us that that if 40% of people develop serious problems because of alcohol, the Christian is going to look at this stuff and say, no problem. This is a no-brainer. The Bible makes it clear that we should avoid these very things. 
King Solomon, the wisest man that ever lived, said, Wine is a mocker, strong drink is a baller, and whoever is led astray by it is not wise. Now, is he talking about the fermented or the unfermented stuff here? The fermented. The context makes it abundantly clear. He says that wine will make fun of you, wine will mock you, wine will trash you and thrash you. What did we read earlier? Alcohol plus watch this equals 911. That's right. Proverbs 23, verse 29. Who hath woe? Who hath sorrow? Who hath contentions? Who hath babbling? Who hath wounds without cause? Who hath redness of eyes? They that tarry long at the wine, they that go to seek mixed wine. Verse 31. Look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth his color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. At the last, it biteth like a serpent, it stingeth like an adder. Thine eyes shall behold strange women, and thine heart shall utter perverse things. Yea, thou shalt be as he that lieth down in the midst of the sea, or as he that lieth upon the top of a mast. They have stricken me, shalt thou say, and I was not sick. They have beaten me, and I felt it not. When shall I awake? I will seek it again. Did you know that? Those of you who have, who have drank alcohol, you know that it, it numbs your nerves. Therefore, you don't feel pain as you normally would. Which is why it says, They have beaten me, and I felt it not. Solomon here is describing the classic drunkard who has wounds without cause and soreness of eyes, etc., etc., and he says he gets knocked out. He is like the person on the top of the mast. And when he finally wakes up, the first thing out of his mouth is, Oh, I need another one. Now let's be clear about something. God loves alcoholics, but he hates alcoholism. God loves the sinner. God loves the sinner, but God hates the what? The sin. 40% of people develop serious problems. Solomon here says, don't even look at it. And that doesn't mean drink it with your eyes closed. What it means is don't lo even look at it. It's a temptation. So somebody says, well, Jesus made wine at the wedding of Cana. You can read all about it in John chapter 2. Yes, Jesus made wine. He made oinos. Jesus could not have made gallons and gallons of unfermented wine when Jesus came here to save humanity. Save what? Save humanity. In Luke chapter 19, verse 10, it says, The Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Jesus' mission was to save people. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 that drunkards will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. Who will not inherit the kingdom of heaven? The drunkards. Now, I want you to think about that for a moment. Drunkards will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. That is, unrepentant drunkards who don't get the victory will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. But wait a minute. 40% of people who drink alcohol develop a serious problem. 40% of people who drink alcohol become drunkards. Friends, Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. He came to rescue us from the pit of sin. He came to set the captives free. Can you imagine Jesus making hundreds and hundreds of gallons of wine just so that everybody can have a great time? Just to make everybody happy? Can you picture Jesus contributing alcohol to a party, knowing that many would go on to develop serious problems and become drunkards, leading to the loss of their salvation? I can't picture it. Okay? I can't see the Jesus of the Bible doing this. Okay? If he did, it would contradict so many scriptures in the Bible. Jesus could not have contributed fermented alcoholic wine to people at the wedding of Cana for two reasons. First of all, the Old Testament prohibits it. The Old Testament what? 
prohibits it. And number two, because Jesus came to save men, not to contribute to their eternal damnation. If that makes sense, say amen. All right. So alcohol cannot be consumed to the glory of God. Even if the Bible said nothing about it. Even if the Bible what? Said nothing about it. Even if the Bible were totally silent on the subject, any Christian with an ounce of common sense, an ounce of what? Can look at the effects of alcohol, can look at it and, and re- see that it cannot be consumed to the glory of God. Okay. And, and someone will say, well, I'm just a social drinker. I just drink a little bit. Friends, nobody starts out thinking, I think I'll become an alcoholic. Is that right? I think I'll become an alcoholic, destroy my marriage, destroy my family. No one starts out that way. Everyone starts out as a social drinker. Is it clear to you that you cannot drink alcohol to the glory of God? Would Jesus make gallons and gallons and gallons of fermented wine so people could get drunk, start hitting on other people's wives, commit adultery, and beat their spouse and children? No. So there are two kinds of wine in the Bible. What are they? Fermented and unfermented. Fresh and rotten. That's right. Let's fill in the blanks at the bottom. Even if the Bible were completely silent on the subject of alcohol, any individual with what? An ounce of common sense can look at the effects of alcohol and say that it cannot be consumed to the glory of God. We live in a day and age where common sense is not so common anymore, right? Okay. Friends, we need to make sure we stand on the Word of God. We'll do all right if we're following Bible truth. Next question. Can you smoke to the glory of God? It's not just alcohol. There are other lifestyle practices that will destroy and shorten our lives. Dr. Linus Pauling said that every cigarette you smoke takes how many minutes off your life? 14.5 minutes off of your life. You can jot that down, top of page 3. Dr. Linus Pauling said that every cigarette you smoke takes 14.5 minutes off of your life. Now, there is no Bible verse that says, Thou shalt not smoke. Is that correct? And there is no verse that says, You shall not smoke crack cocaine either. God has given us minds. God has given us what? And He expects us to use common sense. If cigarettes are shortening your life, is it possible to do it to the glory of God who Himself, the life giver, who is Himself the life giver? No. Friends, God is the author of life. Satan is the destroyer of life. Satan is the what? Satan is out to cut short our lives. Anything that prematurely shortens our lives is not from God, but is from Satan. That's right. Now, once again, please remember, God hates cigarettes, but what does God love? God loves cigarette smokers. God hates alcohol but he loves alcoholics. I have a friend who likes to say, there's no high like the most high. So friends, we need to get into the word of God and we need to get high on Jesus. Amen? Look at this. Nicotine ends in I-N-E. Cocaine ends in I-N-E. Heroin ends in I-N-E. Strychnine ends in I-N-E. And guess what? Caffeine ends in I-N-E. You may be looking at the last one and thinking, did I read that correctly? Friends, caffeine is a very strong stimulant. Is that right? You cannot consume caffeine without being unaffected by its stimulant properties. So let's go to the study guide and fill in the blanks. The following deadly chemical cousins are all of the same subnarcotic class and end in what? I-N-E. Nicotine, cocaine, heroin, strychnine, and caffeine. K 
Caffeine is a drug. If we can't shoot heroin to the glory of God, and if we can't take cocaine to the glory of God, and if we can't take strychnine to the glory of God, then doesn't it stand to reason that we can't take caffeine to the glory of God? Friends, God has given us bodies. He's given us what? He's given us bodies, and He wants us to take care of those bodies. Caffeine is a potent stimulant. And the energy drinks, they are loaded with caffeine. Doctors urge FDA to restrict caffeine in energy drinks. Caffeine is highly addictive, and if you don't believe that, try quitting. You'll find it isn't easy. You'll have withdrawals, just like a smoker. You'll get headaches, and you might experience some trembling. Yeah, for several days. It's not easy to quit. Caffeine is a potent stimulant. Caffeine blues. Wake up to the hidden dangers of America's number one what? Drug. Drug. On the cover of the National Geographic magazine, it says why we love caffeine. All right, now let's talk about eating to the glory of God. The Apostle Paul said, therefore, whether you eat or drink, do all to the glory of God. There are many things that God has created that he wants us to eat, like fruits and vegetables, which are good for our bodies. But there are other things that were not meant to be eaten. If we are living for the glory of God, we simply can't put into our mouths everything our heart desires. Lifestyle-related diseases like obesity, high blood pressure, and diabetes are off the charts. Many are going to an early grave simply because of poor eating habits. Because of what? Our food choices affect our bodies, our minds, and our children. How can we eat to the glory of God? In Genesis chapter 7, verse 2, God instructed Noah, saying, You shall take with you seven, each of every what? Clean animal, Clean animal a male and a female, to each of animals that are what? Unclean, a male and his female. Why seven of the clean? Because after the flood, there was no vegetation and they needed animals for sacrifices. Man was also given permission to begin eating meat. All right, that's why seven of the clean. How many of the unclean? Two. What would have happened if they would have eaten one of the unclean animals? That species would have been what? Gone extinct, right? So, so they, they knew which were clean and they knew which were unclean. When God created Adam and Eve, he put them in the garden and they were fruitarians. They were what? Fruitarians. Adam and Eve only ate fruit, but after the flood, man was given permission to eat meat. All right, let's fill in the blanks. There, middle of uh, page three. Eating to the glory of God. God instructed Noah to bring into the ark how many of every clean animal? Seven. Seven. But only two of the unclean animal. Why? After the flood, God gave humans permission to eat meat. Long before there was a what on this earth? Long before there was a Jew on this earth, Noah had the distinction between the clean and unclean animals. Now, the chart here on the screen shows that the ages of the patriarchs declined significantly following the flood. What you're seeing there, the figures do not represent their heights, but their relative ages. Noah is the one there holding the boat. And you have the people that lived before him, Adam lived 930 years. Methuselah lived 969 years. After the flood, people began eating meat. Now, there were a number of other factors that caused the decline in life expectancy, but meat eating would have been one of the most significant. God has given us permission to eat meat, but the meat we eat has to be clean meat. What kind of meat? Clean, clean meat. Leviticus 11 verse 3 says, Among the animals, whatever divides the hoof, having cloven hooves and chewing the what? Cud. That you may eat. Now what does that mean? Chew the cud. Cud is 
partially digested food that is regurgitated to be chewed again, a common behavior of cows and sheep. Okay, they have a very complicated digestive system. They chew it, they digest it, and then regurgitate it. Kind of sounds disgusting, doesn't it? <laughs> All right, let's jot this down in our study guide. According to Leviticus 11 verse 3, if you are going to eat an animal, it has to have two things, cloven, hooves, in other words, split the hoof, or chew the cud. Chew the cud. Swine is considered clean or unclean because they have cloven hooves, but they do not chew the cud. You have to have both. Spit the hoof and chew the cud. Swine is a scavenger. A scavenger is an animal that feeds on decaying organic matter, especially on refuse. In Leviticus chapter 11, you can find a list of the clean animals that you can eat and also a list of the unclean animals. The cow is clean or unclean? Clean. clean because it has cloven hooves and chews the cud. Deer and elk are clean. But what about a horse? Unclean because they don't chew the cud and they don't split the hoof. Someone says, hey, that's only for the Jews. Only for the who? Was Noah a Jew? Noah wasn't a Jew. Noah came before the Jews, before the first Jew, Abraham, by several hundred years. Pig is an unclean meat, according to the Bible. Pork has the highest fat content of all meats. Did you know that? Highest fat content. And is not to be eaten if you're going to follow what the Bible has to say. If you want to postpone your funeral, you're not going to want to eat that stuff. A pig farmer, a pig what? Farmer. Had a dog that went into a field and relieved himself. Flies swarmed around the pile of poop. A frog then eats those flies. The frog is then eaten by a snake which slithers into the pig pen and is eaten by the pigs. Those pigs are then consumed by people. Why not just start your meal where the dog relieved himself? Let's go to the seafood. In Leviticus 11 verse 9, it says, These you may eat of all that are in the water. Whatever in the water has fins and scales. Whatever in the seas or in the rivers, that you may eat. Verse 10, But all in the seas or in the rivers that do not have fins and scales, all that move in the water, or any living thing which is in the water, they are an abomination to you. So if you want to eat anything that comes out of the water, it has to have two things. What are those two things? Fins and scales. Yes. Let's fill in the blanks. The top of the last page. According to Leviticus 11.9, if you are going to eat a sea creature, it has to have fins and scales. Catfish and shark fish are considered clean or unclean? unclean? Unclean because they have fins, but they do not have scales. Shark and catfish. But salmon, trout, and tuna are clean. Salmon, trout, and tuna are clean. Dr. Bruce Halstead's research confirms the Bible's instructions. Dr. Bruce Halstead did some research for the Navy, and he basically said, listen, sailors, when you get shot down and you are on an island and trying to make do with eating some fish out of the sea, this is what you can eat. And he produced this huge manual. And finally, finally, the Navy said, we can't expect our sailors to read this whole manual. How can they know in a more simplistic way? He said, simple, if it has fins and scales, it's safe to eat. If it doesn't, don't eat it. Very simple. If it has fins and scales, it's safe to eat. Are shrimp clean or unclean? Unclean because they have no fins and no scales. What about lobsters and oysters? Unclean. Unclean. I'm sorry, I know these things taste so good, right? 
Beyond. <laughs> shellfish are dirty and dangerous, according to Prevention Magazine. Shellfish are filter feeders. What does that mean? They filter all the impurities that all the other animals in the sea are getting rid of. They are filter feeders. God created certain things to be eaten and other things not to be eaten because certain animals were created to be scavengers or filter feeders. If God has created something to be eaten, you can eat it. God has given permission to eat clean foods. Now, what about the birds? In Leviticus chapter 11, verses 13 through 19, you can find a list of the birds you can eat. It's very simple. You, you don't eat things like vultures and hawks and kites and kestrel and falcons and owls. The birds that are chicken-like birds that are referred to as the gallinaceous birds. They're heavy-bodied and largely ground-feeding birds. Those you can eat. That would be like the grouse, the turkey, the chicken, etc. So there in your study guide. What about the birds? Is it okay to eat chicken and turkey? Yes. yes. But that's just for the Jews. Well, we've already addressed this, right? Noah wasn't a Jew. He predated the Jews by several hundred years. If God instructed Noah about the distinction between clean and unclean animals, it must mean those distinctions existed before the time of the Jews. Notice what God says in Exodus chapter 15, verse 26. If you diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight, give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of these diseases on you, which I have brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. Amen. Is that a beautiful promise? Amen. Okay. Friends, in these last days, okay, we've got all kinds of stuff, okay, all kinds of stuff, being transmitted. It is so important that we follow God's optimal plan for healthy living. Amen? God says, if you follow my laws, my commandments, my statutes, my health principles, you're not going to get sick like the Egyptians. Once again, if you can only remember one thing from this presentation, I want you to remember that God loves you. God what? He loves you. And because he loves you, he wants you to be happy. And God knows that you are happiest when you are healthiest. Amen. Does that make sense? Think of God as a good parent. Would you let your child have five pieces of chocolate cake? No. Why? Because you hate him? No, because you love him. And you want the best for him. We read this earlier. Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. God is concerned about our physical, mental, and emotional health, not just our spiritual health. Amen? National Geographic ran an article. The cover article was titled, The Secrets of Living Longer. They looked at the three healthiest population groups in the world that lived the longest. The Okinawans, which is an isolated geographical group. The Sardinians, which is an isolated geographical group. And there was a third interesting group of people. <laughs> They're called Seventh-day Adventists. They are the three healthiest groups of people in the world. You can jot them down. You have the Okinawans, Sardinians, and the Seventh-day Adventists. Have you heard of the Seventh-day Adventists? There have been government-sanctioned studies. Why are the Seventh-day Adventists so healthy and living longer? Do you know why? The answer is simple. The, Ad the Adventists follow the Bible's guidelines for optimum physical, mental, moral, and spiritual health. Amen. The average Seventh-day Adventist lives 7 to 10 years longer than the average person. Is it 11 years? Okay. Why? Why? Because God loves them more? No. Because they are living by the Bible's prescription, prescription for optimum physical health. 
Now, I'm not saying to you, you have to become a Seventh-day Adventist so you can live longer. What I'm saying is, we need to follow the Bible. Amen. Follow the Bible and the Bible only, and God will lead you. God will guide you. He wants you to be physically healthy. He wants you to be spiritually healthy. He wants you to be emotionally healthy. He wants you to be mentally healthy. Am I a Seventh-day Adventist? Yes. Why? Because they follow the Bible most closely and because everything they teach comes from a plane, thus saith the Lord. That's why I am a Seventh-day Adventist. Do I also follow the Bible's prescription for health? Yes, I do. And I invite every one of you to seriously consider doing the same thing. Now, the person who welcomed us this evening. His name, Pastor Gary Strunk. He's working pretty much full time. He puts in 35 hours each week, running his own business. It's an occupation that is physically demanding. Do you know what he does? He works as a massage therapist. It is a very physically demanding occupation. In fact, I went online and what I read today is that most massage therapists work part-time. You know why? To preserve their bodies so they can have a longer career. Because it's not easy. It's physically demanding. So you have to be in good health to be a massage therapist. Are you with me? Do you know how old Pastor Gary Strunk is? 75. He's in his 80s. He's two years away from retirement. Okay. He plans to retire at the age of 90. From his work as a massage therapist, he's 88. He's going to retire in about two years, but he's, he told me not from active ministry. He plans on continually doing active ministry. Is that amazing? Is that amazing? Absolutely amazing. Yes. This is an article from U.S. News and World Report. 10 health habits that will help you to live 200. I have a good feeling he's going to make it 200. <laughs> 10 health habits that will help you to live 200. I want to show you tip number eight. And as I read it, you can fill in the blanks of the last paragraph. Live like a Seventh-day Adventist. Americans who define themselves as Seventh-day Adventists have an average life expectancy of 89. It's average. So there are many living way past 89 because that's, that's the average. About a decade longer than the average American. It goes on to say, one of the basic tenets of the religion is that it's important to cherish the body that's on loan from who? God, which means no smoking, alcohol abuse, or overindulging it's in sweets. I'm not saying it's wrong to eat sweets, but we're, we're talking about overindulging in sweets. Followers typically stick to a vegetarian diet based on fruits, vegetables, beans, and nuts and get plenty of exercise. They're also very focused on family and community. Friends, once again, remember that God loves you so much because he loves you, he wants you to be what? He wants you to be happy. And God knows that you are happiest when you are healthiest. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the truth, for giving us the truth, not because you hate us, but because you love us so much and you want what is best for us. Thank you for showing us this evening how we can live lives that are healthier and happier. Father, in these last days of earth's history, as gross darkness is settling upon this earth, help us to let our light shine brightly for you and live lives that will bring you glory, honor, and praise. We pray all these things in the precious and holy name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us today. We hope and pray that this service has uplifted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior and that you personally have been drawn closer to Him. If you have any questions or comments, please text us at 909-492-0738 or email us at office at mentonechurch.org. We look forward to seeing you next time. God bless.